OK. So with that, we are live. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this installment of the NAF Research and Tech Talk series. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Nick Menar. I'm the Director of Research and Reporting here at NAF. Um, and I really just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for joining us live here for this talk. I'm still admitting some people here and there, but um, we, we had a good sized crowd RSVP for this, so I'm really excited. Uh, if this is your first time attending one of these talks, um, no worries. We like to create a small learning environment here. So why don't in the chat, you just go ahead and say who you are, what organization you're from, where you're coming from today. Feel free to be friendly. Uh, just so you know, this talk will be recorded. It is being recorded and it will be posted to multiple outlets after the talk in case you have to leave early or want to share it with a friend. It will be posted to our NAF YouTube channel as well as our NAF Educator Facebook page and then also our NAF Research and Tech LinkedIn page. So again, in case you want to share it with anyone or just want to rewatch it again, I'm going to drop the links for our LinkedIn page and our Facebook educator page in the chat right now. So if you haven't given us a follow on each of those, uh, be, sh be sure that you do so that you can keep up to date on just future talks and, and other news and announcements. Uh, if you've never attended one of these talks before, that's quite all right. Really, the purpose of these talks is to bring cutting edge research and best practices to all of you, our NAF educators, our NAF staff, just so that you can use that information to improve your practice and perhaps just get ideas about how to better serve your students. As such, don't be afraid to ask questions in the chat. Um, Martha and I will be keeping an eye on the chat as we go, and we'll try to answer any questions you may have that pop up during the talk. But we also have some dedicated Q&A time for the last 15 minutes of the hour. If you would like to come off mute, come on video, and ask your question directly, that's however you would like to engage us is totally fine. All right, so now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let me uh, just quickly introduce our guest. Let me make Martha our spotlight here. All righty. Our guest today here is Martha Ross. Uh, Martha is a senior fellow at Brookings Metro, where she researches and writes about workers and the labor market with a focus on creating a healthy economy that offers opportunity for all. Martha's recent work highlights low wage workers out of work young people and adults, the education and employment experience of 18 and to 24 year olds, and pathways to good jobs for young people. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, Martha has written and spoken about the virus's disproportionate impact on low, low wage workers and young adults, and its effects on housing instability, and also strategies to promote an equitable recovery. Prior to joining Brookings, Martha was a Presidential Management Fellow in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Ev Evaluation in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and there her work focused on welfare policy. Martha has a master's degree from the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration and a bachelor's degree from Colorado College, so right around here. I'm really happy to have a, the chance to speak with you today, Martha, and just to have a sit down in this fireside chat. And um, yeah, thank you for coming and how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for um, inviting me. Um, I'm always happy to talk to folks like you and groups like NAF. I see in the chat the names of um, NAF people who have graciously talked with me when I am asking questions and looking for information and insights. So thanks again. Yeah, we're really happy to have you here and to share in any of those insights that we might be able to provide so that you can have your own insights and share those with us. Uh, I shared a little bit with our audience just about, you know, your official background and your work at Brookings and before, but just to set the stage a little bit, uh, what got you into this line of work um, that you're doing over at Brookings? Was it kind of something that you always wanted to do or did you find yourself kind of moving that way towards your career? Um, it was not something that I wanted, always wanted to do. Um, like, I don't think I knew what public policy was um, <laughs> or even that interested in government classes um, when I was in high school. 
I was a bookworm and I grew up in a university town. Some of my friends' parents were professors, so I kind of assumed I would I might be an English professor, um, which is, you know, not the most specific career plan. Um, but and then I majored in literature in college and then at the end of college I was like I don't want to do more of this <laughs> <laughs> you said that's enough yeah like re read and love books for pleasure don't want to do it professionally yeah yeah so um I looked around for internships and um found some uh internships and I just sort of was I gravitated towards like public interest groups um and got an internship in Washington, D.C. that focused on public policy and public health. And and that's what got me interested. Um, but actually, but now that I think about it, you know, like my mom was on the school board when I was growing up and my school district went through desegregation when I was in it. And so starting in fourth grade, I got bused to the nearby city. And, you know, I, it's not like I was a super thoughtful kid, but it just like it left an impression on me like it's sort of like desegregation is a thing like there are problems <laughs> there are social problems and we need to do things to try to fix them absolutely. so i guess i guess that kind of sunk in absolutely and i was happy to hear that a work-based learning opportunity like an internship kind of sparked your interest in the area you are now because yeah. the bulk of our conversation today is really going to be around work-based learning which as you know, NAF really has a keen interest in. Um, so when you when you talk about your whole work portfolio, what made you wanna also focus on work-based learning? Was it part of that personal experience you had or other factors? Like what was the general impression? Well, um, the work that I do is a mix of data analysis and then looking at policies and programs to support better, better outcomes. Um, <clears throat> and, so it was just I first learned about work based learning just through scanning the field of of youth employment programs. But there were there were two a couple things actually that really made it sort of pop for me. Um, one was reading some books and articles by Robert Halpern, um, who's a retired professor at Northwestern, I think in human development. Um, and and he wrote about how the school systems are are ironically um, at, at high school, just at the moment when students need to begin to learn about the world and interact with it, they're in this closed system where they mostly interact with peers and then with the adults who are who are teachers or administrators. Um, and and the students only have one role, you know, like their primary role right. is to be a student. Um, and and he also wrote some some work about how apprenticeships and internships and work based learning are really developmentally appropriate for adolescents and teens. Um, so that 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 made me think about like, you know, how can we do this better? Um, and then I worked on a report with Child Trends, another think tank, where we looked at um, we looked at young adults who had experienced at least one disadvantage in adolescence, like coming from a low income family or neither parents had a college degree or something like that. And we tracked how many of them um, had what we defined as a good job at age 30, which was a mix of like wages and benefits and job satisfaction. Um, and then we also looked at predictors of that, of and one of the predictors was something that we called a very clunkily relationship based career and technical education. That was a predictor of having um, a good job at age 30. And it, it wasn't a huge impact, but in the. But to have an impact 10 years later is mm -hmm. notable um, and the and. Like the. The reason we use this weird phrase relationship based CTE had had to do with the data source we were using. Um, the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, and so they had these questions about CTE and we were like, you know, these are different experiences, so let's break up internships and apprenticeships from, you know, like. I forget what some of the others were like 
career days or whatever. So, so the more intensive relationship based forms of CTE we found, you know, predicted a better job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at age 30. When you think about all the things that go into a satisfying job, a good job at age 30, it, so that really struck home with you that this one thing was a, you know, a not a huge, huge predictor, but at least contributing to that field, right? So that's what really you think kind of set you off on that path of investigating work-based learning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be a really powerful lever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love hearing about that because, yeah, when you just think about everything, if you're like, oh, this one thing seems to be really important, I need to look into that a little more. And I'm so glad you did because we're going to be talking about some of the research that you've done on work-based learning. I'm actually going to drop a link in the chat for anyone who would like to check it out. Um, this is this is actually the article we're going to be spending most of our time on today just discussing here with Martha. It came out in late 2020 and it's titled Work-Based Learning Can Advance Equity and Opportunity for America's Young People. So this landing page will bring you to that report and then you can download the um, PDF directly. But uh, Martha, can you set the stage a little bit for us just by telling our audience, you know, what were you hoping to achieve in this research that I just linked, um, you and your co-authors, you know, what did you want to highlight when when writing it? Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, I had done I do a mix of data and policy stuff, and in, and in addition to that report that I mentioned before, I had done something with um, researcher Andrew Sum at Northeastern University. He's he's retired now, but he was just like the guy on youth employment stats. Um, and we looked at, you know, employment rates and such and unemployment among teens, 16 to 19, and then young adults, 20 to 24. And, um, you know, labor, this is not a surprise to this group, but labor market stratification starts young. Um, so among those age groups, those, you know, those who are white from higher um, income backgrounds, and who had work experience and who had higher levels of education did better in the labor market. Um, so you can see that uh, like some of that is stuff you can't do anything about, like you can't change the income of a teen's family, but you can say, well, all right, work experience does predict um, employment down the line, work begets work. So, so that got me, thinking about it um, more. Um, and, and then there was this, um, you know, I, this finding from this research with child trends and um, the child trends folks have some like de developmental psychologists on staff mm -hmm. and other otherwise like we're most at Brookings, we're mostly like, you know, public policy people. Um, but developmental psychology is really important field and the I, I just thought the insights from that were interesting you know which was that you know the importance of relationships and it's through relationships that you learn um and so i wanted to to look more into that um because what what i was thinking was that you know work-based learning draws upon some different um I don't know, like academic and 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 employment disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, education, obviously, like youth development and workforce development. And but those three fields of work are often fairly siloed. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Not a lot of overlap. And I wanted to try to bring them together in in a more thoughtful way. No, that's great. We're so glad that you did. And the equity piece that you mentioned is super, super important because actually in the very beginning of this article, you mentioned, and, and I quote, the educational and employment landscapes are riddled with inequities that routinely disadvantage young people who are black, Latino or Hispanic or low income. Now, that's a really powerful opening position that can't really be articulated enough, in my opinion. Can you tell us a bit more about some of these inequities, um, just so that when we're talking about how work-based learning can address some of them, we kind of have a common understanding. Is there anything you want our audience to be sure they know about? 
Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and hopefully what I say will resonate with the experience of, of folks on this on this call. Um, we have a I think we have one of the worst systems to help young people transition from, you know, adolescence and education to adulthood and financial independence, like in the industrialized world. Like we yeah. just <laughs> in terms of supports, you mean? Yes, yeah, in terms of supports and and structures, um, you are really on your own. Um, and if you have a family that is knowledgeable and savvy and has enough money, you're you know, you're going to wend your way through post-secondary education pretty well, odds odds are. Um, but um, if if you don't come from that family background, it's, you know, I, I don't like your odds. Uh, and the, the problem that I see with how we have operationalized this idea of college for all is that we, we put out the aspiration without actually creating the conditions for students to successfully find a good fit, enroll, and complete. I mean, it's it's like a mirage when when you look at what the attrition rates are um, at at a lot of these schools. Um, you know, and that disproportionately hurts people of color and from low income backgrounds. Those are the ones and those are the students and it's it's often the schools that they go to like open access universities or community colleges that have high attrition rates. Um, so, and employers employers are going to default to things that they know when they're hiring. So they understand college degrees. It's become a proxy um, for work readiness and the people who are college graduates are disproportionately white and from higher income backgrounds. And they're also going to default to social networks. Um, and if that's going to be people that they already know, which is going to be an ex you know, it, it's exclusive. Um, so it. Sorry, I just like went on a rant. No, no, that's <laughs> that's quite all right. Um, you're right, because these inequities are pervasive, and I think there is kind of a lack of support. Like you said, it, actually, in the article, you lay it out. There seems to be less support in this country than any other industrialized country out there in terms of getting students from, you know, grade school, high school, then to those college and potentially high paying jobs. You know, there just seems to be a lot less. And you even throw out a statistic in this paper that school districts that predominantly teach students of color receive on average about $2,200 less in funding per pupil than districts that are predominantly white. So it's it's not a localized matter, it's across the whole country. So these kinds of inequities are important for the audience to kind of understand so that when we talk about how work-based learning can overcome that, or at least, at least try to help overcome that, you know, we kind of have a common understanding of that. Yeah. Uh, let me let me switch to the audience here. Brooke was asking, I know you know Brooke, but she was asking in legislative circles, work based learning often only equates to internships and apprenticeships, kind of those longer term, usually paid experiences that are often challenging for schools to navigate and for local employers to support. Um, how can we ensure that these audiences also incentivize and elevate kind of shorter work based learning engagements like job shadows or informational interviews that can still be really beneficial, but maybe don't take as you know long form as a as an internship or apprenticeships? Um, do you see any kind of any kind of answer to there or any kind of thoughts there on just increasing student awareness that those connections you were talking about? can also be made in the shorter term work based learning opportunities. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, I think one of the things to emphasize is that work based learning is a continuum, uh, which is sort of inherent in, in Brooks comment, and most of the attention goes on sort of the deeper, more intensive end of the continuum, but you you get ready for that end by participating in some of these other shorter term ones. Um, so I would, I mean, it's a, it's a good question about, I, I, I think actually 
you all could have an interesting discussion about how we support more, how we get more support for these, and I could learn from listening to you guys from your experience. Um, but I, I think a lot of it is just sort of like the narrative that work-based learning is not just one thing, and it's a it's a process and a continuum. Absolutely. Oh, and you you have a you have a cheerleader in the audience there with Brooke. She says she's <laughs> always happy to partner, with Martha. Oh, <laughs> Thanks, great. Brooke. Thanks. Um, before we dive into some of the some of some of the other things you say in your article around quality work based learning and how that can overcome inequities, is is there anything else our audience should know, kind of about just the work based learning landscape in general, or anything else you wanted to get across before we kind of dive into it there? Um, I don't think so. I think we covered okay. what I wanted to cover. Okay, great. And again, just a reminder to the audience, if a question pops up or you have anything you would like Martha to address directly, feel free to pop it in the chat or we will have some dedicated time here at the end uh, for Q&A. So uh, let's dive deep for a moment, Martha, just on what students actually learn through a high quality work based learning experience. Now, the work that I shared previously, your work uh, acknowledges that not all work based learning is equal and there's a lot of variability from program to program. Um, but as an organization like NAF that really advocates for work based learning to help, you know, students, um, what does high quality work based learning actually look like? Can you tell us just what in your experience, what the literature says, what are those ingredients that educators should be looking for when they're looking for high quality work based learning experiences for their students? Yeah, um, I we we came we identified three components that should be integrated. Um, one is positive relationships with adults that support growth and development. Um, the second is social capital that helps um, you know, young people access information and contacts that they might otherwise not have. And then authentic work experiences, you know, like the actual sub substance of it, that it's not busy work, that it offers opportunities to for hands on learning and exposing young people to new environments and expectations. Um, and within the. Um, Within the youth employment field, I think that positive relationships and social capital are widely recognized. I think they are, they're not incentivized in most funding streams, um, which is a real problem. Um, but when I was reading up on developmental relationships, I um, search institute in Minneapolis is a real leader on this, and I was looking at what their what they described as the five components of a developmental re relationship, and they map really well onto the attributes of a good supervisor or mentor. Um, so they are, you know, emotional attachment or caring, you know, so like that uh, ask questions about their life, you know, have a give and take. Um, you set high expectations. That means that you set them challenges that lead to growth. Um, you show them how to carry out work duties and provide feedback. And that way you're providing support. You discuss options for solving a problem and carrying out a task and getting their feedback. That's sharing power. Um, and you ask them about their interests and introduce them to new places and people and ideas, and that's expanding possibilities. I mean, it's just it maps really well. Um, I think some people, you know, some administrators or some policymakers may feel a little bit um, intimidated by the phrase, you know, positive, supportive developmental relationship because they may think that it inherently means something that is like uh, emotionally loaded or like that you really have to commit like you're spending a lot of time and of course you can and some of those relationships are very are very deep but to be valuable it doesn't have to be super emotionally intensive um, you can provide a lot of value 
by just being sort of an engaged adult. Sure, by having bi-directional interactions with the young people, trying to help them grow. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it has to be um, for for the relationship to be beneficial. It doesn't have to be like you were saying this big, in-depth, long-term, you know, thing. It could just be something like, "Hey, you want to learn more about career field X? I'm here to answer your questions. You know, let me let me help you kind of through that process and demystify it a bit. Yeah, kind of gaining some skills. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm seeing a question here from Brooke, so I wanted to be sure to address it here. Um, she's asking, how are legislators actually thinking about social capital for students? Um, and how are we thinking about measuring the impact of this, particularly through work-based learning? Um, any, any insight out there on what might be valuable to measure in terms of social capital or how are legislators thinking about it? Because like you said, they may not have they may not be conceptualizing it correctly. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I don't know how much they do think about it. It probably varies. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think it is. I mean, I would look to groups like Search and Christensen for more thoughtful discussions on how to measure it. Um, but it could be as simple as, um, you know, like for. I, I've also looked into summer jobs programs, um, and one of the one of the problems with them is that they're measured mostly by counting how many students were placed. Um, and you know, even just a measure like how many students were placed and how many had at least two performance assessments and left with the name of you know, a supervisor or a contact that they could use as a reference, you know, like they had established that with a with one of the people in their in their workplace, like set those up as. As expectations um, as a way to. To incentivize these. Mm -hmm. and, and then I think intentional about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think Search and Christensen will have much more sophisticated thoughts. <laughs> OK. Thanks for that question, Brooke. Expectation setting is certainly important. Yes, that's what Brooke is saying. Um, in terms of some of those um, kind of social capital, you, you talked about positive relationships, and that's something positive developmental relationships. That's something we can look out for. Um, but in terms of work based learning and expanding a young person's social capital compared to other learning, other learning environments. What what makes work based learning kind of special in that regard? Um, is it just the mere fact of meeting someone outside the student's personal network or outside their educational setting? Like, what do you think it is about work based learning that is kind of unique to help a student expand their social capital? Yeah, well, it it, it is the fact that you know, by its nature, it's it's putting a, a young person in a new environment usually, um, but it's also putting them in that new environment in a different role. Um, and a, a role where they are expected to. To perform, um, you know, and and ideally you've got a supervisor who's, you know, uh, who's giving the right balance of high expectations and support, and there are are meaningful tasks. But mm -hmm. it's I, I think you know it it might be the first time that someone interacts with an adult in a in a like a non non coach non teacher student relationship. So you start to have this understanding of like, OK, I have to carry my my weight here. I'm contributing to something that we're working on together. Um, and you know, we may not be peers, you know, I'm the mm -hmm. student is going to be younger and more junior, but we're we're part of the same team working towards the same goal. Yeah, moving um, in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah, and and so that I think also makes a young person think differently about themselves and and these contacts like makes the people more relevant to them in a, in a way mm -hmm. 
kind of because it kind of it also kind of in a way breaks the mold of I'm the teacher, you're the student. Rather, we're working on this together, sharing each other's expertise, kind of thing. And work-based learning, you're right, is unique for that, right? Because it it might be the first time a student has ever been in that kind of situation with an adult. Yeah, yeah. All right, we have a question here from Alyssa. She's saying, Martha, what are your thoughts on teens communicating with professionals through LinkedIn? You know, or a social networking kind of platform. Uh, some programs promote the use of LinkedIn for students to begin building relationships or gaining a mentor. Um, have you? Do you have any thoughts on that? Just uh, either formally or informally on some of those the ways new technology is kind of making those connections possible. Yeah, um, that is interesting, and it it is an example of how of how technology provides a chance for connection that there might not otherwise be. Um, what I, to be successful, I think the teens need to have sufficient preparation to communicate, you know, clearly and, um, have a sense of of why they want to do it and know how to communicate with an adult. Um, I like I I worry that um, some over enthusiastic folks could just sort of put a teen on a laptop and give them I don't know fifteen minutes of orientation and then say like go write someone. Um, go network. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, you know, and I, they need some more, they need some more preparation, um, which, you know, is the, the nub of, of work-based learning. So that actually brings up a good point um, that we, that we at NAF also, a lot of, a lot of folks actually on, on this call are specifically focused on kind of prepping folks, prepping young students for an internship or a professional interview. So you think that is, that part of the uh, preparation translates even across like social media and kind of virtual platforms. You think that's also important? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they're doing so much elect, you know, like they're digital natives, but like, I, I don't know, they're digital natives on TikTok, um, which <laughs> is, a, <laughs> I mean, that's a generalization, but you know, they're, there are specific ways of communicating in specific groups of people and we want to, you know, we if in some cases it's probably worth it to think of helping them code switch so that you're you're sort of affirming the value of what they already know and do and then saying, OK, now these other spaces to succeed have some different roles and we want you to succeed. Um, so here are the rules, <laughs> you right. know. Right. Um, really, that last component of um, some of that high quality work based learning experiences that you that you want folks to be on the lookout for is uh, providing those new environments, those expectations for hands on learning. Uh, many in the field, including NAF, take that kind of, kind of continuum approach, right, where students are gradually kind of exposed to these new environments and learning hands on skills. Um, but do you have anything for what should our audience really walk away with um, kind of knowing about this this aspect of quality work based learning? Um, is it kind of the culmination of of some preparation or how do you how do you see it kind of fitting into the the overall structure of what makes work based learning really impactful? Um, I, I think you were asking about specifically like the, the relationship aspect of it? Either the relationships or kind of just being exposed to those new environments. Like uh, okay. why, why is that so, why is that so important? Yeah. Um, well, I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of the NAF folks, um, you're operating in environments that you have to sort of Jerry rig into into making a way for you to do your job. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, when when you think 
you know, schools are judged on, you know this better than me, but like graduation rates and test scores, um, not on work-based learning placements. Right. And so you have to, I would think, you know, work pretty hard to keep your program um, keep it going and and continually making the case for it. May I, this may be overly dramatic. Um, I think it probably varies by school and by district and by state. Um, but you know, I think you have to look pretty carefully at the organizational context in which you're operating. Um, and you are like, there are some really time intensive things and skill intensive and staff intensive involved in building quality work based learning programs. You know, Absolutely. like it, it takes work to build meaningful relationships with employers. Um, it takes work to make sure that your relationship with the employer goes past like your contact who might be in HR or might be a CEO or whatever and gets to that person who is going to be supervising your student and you know making sure that student making sure that person has the tools they need to be an effective supervisor um, and then to look within your own organization and think and look at it and say um, how is my workflow or process supporting the creation of positive relationships, but both between the student and the supervisor, but also between the school staff and the intermediary staff and the and the young person? Um, so you know that means like um, like Brooke was mentioning, thinking about measures you know how do you measure positive relationships um and how do you how do you make that part of someone's um job description it's not just like yeah yeah you should you know let the kids know you care about them like it should <laughs> <laughs> like it is there a, is there an understanding that it takes there's it takes time and there's a process and there are steps to building positive relationships and are those supported within your organization um, and to the extent that you can try to try to build in that organizational infrastructure um, to, to allow that to happen yeah i know i know just as there's a spectrum of work-based learning and the quality of that work-based learning there's also a spectrum of like school districts and principals who are even interested in it like you said because there aren't necessarily those stand, they're not being graded or judged on those metrics, right? Um, I do like to see that work-based learning as part of the Perkins reporting now. Um, and I have my own kind of issues with that because it won't address quality. It's kind of more just seat time, you know, and head count. But uh, I do like that it is part of, it is becoming part of the accountability culture, at least in that. Um, let me address some, some audience questions here. Uh, Brooke is saying again, are there certain states, regions, cities uh, that you see as exemplars for work-based learning, kind of where more students are getting opportunities to participate in these types of activities? Anything off, off top of your head that resonates there? Yeah, um, I mean, there are some, there are some states that have, laid out some you know clear expectations and and a lot of times um you know some of them are in are in the south um like i think south carolina and georgia um colorado has gone in big in the past couple years um through a youth apprenticeship framework which mm -hmm. would be interesting to talk with you guys how much that overlaps or not with what naf is doing ideally there should be you know should be right next to each other. Um, the uh, Rhode Island um, had a, an, an initiative focused on um, work-based learning and preparation for careers. And what was notable about that um, is that it it specifically called out not only high school students but out of school youth or you know, like 20 year olds or 22 year olds who aren't necessarily connected to a school. Um, the, 
I actually have lost track of that because uh, that was what I learned. That was um, I read up on that. While researching the report, but now the governor of Rhode Island is now like the Commerce Secretary and those mm. kinds of priorities priority can, shift yeah. can can shift. Um, it does seem like. Um, South Carolina and Georgia work based learning has gotten. Fairly embedded um, within the for better, or for worse, the state bureaucracy, so it doesn't seem as vulnerable to. <laughs> to changing administrations. Gotcha. Gotcha. And we also had a comment here from uh, Nicole Brown. She's saying every high school needs a full time person to coordinate this effectively. And I assume that means work based learning activities for their students. Absolutely. I would love to see that be a part of every high school in the country, but I don't control the funding, unfortunately, for, <laughs> for every high school in the country. Um, we're about to go into the time where we have can we can just kind of have open Q&A, but I wanted to ask uh, Martha really quickly. Uh, I want to discuss how work based learning can really advance equity in our school systems. Um, just there's a lot of ev there's evidence out there that participating in some form of work based learning, not all types of work based learning, but some can improve the educational and employment outcomes for young people are particularly for students of color from traditionally underfunded school communities and districts. But can you tell us a little more about that? Just how do you see work based learning participation? Um, as really that vehicle that can help drive equity along. Yeah, well, I mean, I. It. It provides. Um, at its best, it provides a, a structure and a, and a route into the formal labor market that the student might not otherwise have. I mean, some students get a huge head start from their families through their own networks and um, sort of knowledge that they pass on. But for those that don't, for whom um, the the work world, say beyond um, beyond some limited occupations, it's kind of a foreign place. Um, and you may think I don't belong there. Like, you know, if, if you look at a white collar workplace, which is also probably going to be predominantly white and you're a person of color, like <laughs> you may think I don't belong there. Um, and, you know, it's incumbent upon the organizations to make it welcoming. Um, but it's also it's a low it's a lower stakes environment to mm. make mistakes and get caught. I mean, get caught like. Um, like not as like have, get, have heavy repercussions for it, right? Yeah, yeah. To, for like someone to be like, OK, yeah, l let me tell you how w why this could have gone badly and, you know, tell you how to navigate stuff like that in the future. Sure. And like what I'm thinking of is uh, there was a an, in a summer jobs program, the head of a workforce development board who was running the program said that one of their teens, their supervisor asked like, oh, how was your weekend or what'd you do? And the, the team just went like, none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you need chances to like make mistakes and get corrected that that are lower stakes than sure. when you are like in a job that you actually need to support yourself or, or your family. So it's it, it can be a more forgiving environment as well. Yeah, absolutely creates like you like one of those quality aspects we talked about. It's a new environment. I wouldn't expect. I mean, when I think back to 18 year old Nick, he didn't know how to enter the job market, the job landscape back then. He would have needed practice back then. So, yeah, it's totally, I think, fair play to allow that environment for young students who are experiencing it the first time. Yeah. I've gone ahead and unmuted and or allowed folks to come off mute or if you want to come on video, if there are any questions directly you want to ask Martha, please feel free to do that. Uh, if not, I'm happy to keep firing questions her way. Oh, Brooke's already off on camera. So, hey, Brooke. Hi, hi, Martha. It's so nice to see you. You too. Um, I, I had one question for you too, just to kind of um, sum up my thoughts on this, but like, what are you kind of working on next? 
in this realm? Like, what are you diving into to learn more about and to advocate for? Um, well, I, what I'm focused on next is, is very adjacent. It's, it is part of work-based learning, but it's not within the, the K through 12 system. Um, I'm focused on, on youth service and conservation core as a, as a structured pathway into the labor market. I mean, you know, Biden pr um, proposed a civilian climate core as part of the build back better legislation and that got so the idea of cores have gotten a ton more visibility um, and, and momentum than they have before, even though Build Back Better right now is not moving. Um, sure. <laughs> to put it lightly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think um, I, I think these core programs have may have such potential um, and you know there are also all kinds of problems the the living allowance is way too low which you know weeds out a lot of people who need the money to support themselves um, but I think uh, one of the things that I've that I've been looking at is how states and state and local governments are using some of their flexible rescue plan funds. Um, and a number of them are using them on youth core type activities, um, not only uh, with a heavy focus on the environment and climate resiliency, but not only, you know, they're also working on, you know, tutoring younger kids in reading. Um, helping to staff food banks, like, you know, maybe not as much now, but setting up vaccination centers and testing sites, that kind of thing. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Bro. Anyone else want to come off mute or on video and ask Martha a question directly? If not, I have no shortage of questions for Martha. Hi, um, Martha, this is Diana. Um, so you said that uh, the core programs have a lot of potential and I kind of just want to know a little bit more of why you think that and how you think that helps the the youth because I'm an in between, right? So I'm, I'm here because I love these talks that NAF does and I just, I really enjoy being here. So, cause we don't actually, we just use, you know, what NAF has to offer and then I try and kind of make it work for my program. Um, but I happen to be a, one of the summer programs in Chicago and we do, we do conservation but we are a high school program that works in the public high schools oh, that's um, great. during the summer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's like in between everything that you're saying, but not <laughs> exactly one of the things that you're talking about. So I'm trying to take as much from you as possible. Um, and so, cause I, I really think that's important. You were talking about, you know, like having, you know, feedback for youth and it's, that's not, something that we've done in the past but we've been thinking about it and so now that you say it I'm like okay that's great we're gonna do that then this summer and like what do you think is the most beneficial for programs to provide for youth to see that growth it's kind of yeah yeah I mean yeah. so also yeah <laughs> Heavy so, question. yeah yeah um I mean are you as a core program are you um are the students working like in crews together rather than being placed you know like in individual offices or organizations yes so what we do i'm going to try and make it really short is we um have several high schools that we work with and then we partner with community gardens or other like natural spaces like forest preserve or the park district to do conservation like work. So our we part of our day is 
teaching the youth about um, things like urban agriculture, urban forestry, um, like green infrastructure and resource conservation, those kind of things. But then we go outside and we work with community partners to, you know, like work on gardening or tree care or, you know, just doing revamping a community garden and making like networking opportunities there. So that's kind of what we do. But I feel like we can always do more. Um, yeah, and, yeah. you know, like, like we feedback is not one thing that we've focused on. But I think now hearing a little bit about that in this talk, I think maybe we should do a lot more of that because yeah. we focused more on the learning part rather than, you know, like what happens afterwards and how they can use it. Um, so, yeah, kind of I mean, like, gosh, there's so much to think about there. I mean, one so a few thoughts is I would think about um, how you can structure the the activities and the work for students to 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 be a team and problem solve together to work through, you know, problems and you know how to how to sequence things or like if you have like have them become a team so both so that they can support each other um and also so that they can get practice in like okay it's not a teacher or an adult who's going to tell us what to do and we all sit back and do it like we have to we have to figure this out together um and i think another aspect is to highlight the huge variety of occupations and industries that this could, you know, lead into. I mean, you know, like probably a bunch of them are like, I don't want to be a farmer. And so, you know, you can be like, that is fine. Like, are you interested, you know, like this could lead to, depending on how you structure it, like, you know, um, environmental groups or gardens or florist shops they need you know they need accountants they need project managers like there's all these types of yeah. of job yeah they need tech they need they need it systems that work um like if 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 this can get them interested in this idea of however you're you're drawing it of of like a a healthy environment like there's room for anyone in that um not just someone who has a green thumb gotcha okay um yeah because i i think i feel like that part is left out with summer programs just in general is how do you transition how do you take what you've learned and then um make it work for your future kind of the, yeah, you know. yeah. Summer jobs programs are asked to do so much in such a compressed amount of time with not enough resources. <laughs> yeah, and and that's and it's just, you know, our program works really hard to try and make it as meaningful as possible, and it's just, you know, trying to figure out how to do that um, in 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 like a six week program mm -hmm. is, is you know. Um, has been you know kind of like back and forth and a little on the difficult side but I think that that's I think connection is probably the key here so is what is from what I'm hearing you know like connecting so okay well that that's perfect thank you Martha I really appreciate it yeah I'm glad to thank talk you. with you about it yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Diana, for asking that. And I, I would just throw on, yeah, any kind of focus on transferable skills as well, because like Martha was saying, you don't necessarily have to have a green thumb to kind of get into that line of work. But, you know, if students are learning problem solving and par as part of that program or just good communication with adults or each other, you know, those are all transferable skills that maybe aren't that, that would serve them in any field they would want to go into. So just a, my quick two cents on the end of that. Thank um, you, we have, I appreciate it. No problem, thank you for being here. Um, we have time for maybe one more question uh, for Martha. Before we before we end, I wanted to be conscious of people's time um, and just keep this talk to an hour. But um, maybe one more question if someone, someone wants to ask anything, anything burning. 
Oh, translating their experiences to a resume is what Brooke is also suggesting, Diana, helping them to kind of take what they learned in that summer program and translating it into a resume, um, into a resume kind of structure and experience. Yeah, Good suggestion. And, and, oh. and also not, not only in written format, but in like a 30 second or 60 second description of what they did, you know. So like an them. elevator pitch. Right? Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, those are great suggestions. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's something that we're I'm trying to kind of like talking about, you know, you talked about TikTok. I think it's kind of funny, but we're trying to use that in a way of of making them talk about themselves really short because <laughs> it's like the new way of living. So, um, OK, great. Yeah, no, wonderful ideas. I really appreciate it. Well, maybe then if, if there's no more, if there isn't any more questions from the audience directly, Martha, maybe you can tell our audience, how can they keep up to date on the work you're doing? Are you posting to social media? Do you have a web page? What would you like our audience to know if they wanted to follow more of your work going forward? Oh, yeah. Well, I have a, I have a Twitter account that I am not as active on as I should be. Um, it's at Martha H. Ross. Um, and I have a piece coming out next month that's looking at employment pathways among people from ages um, 18 to 30, and it'll be on our website, which yeah, Nick has I just, just like that. But mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and what we find in that research is just is so sobering. I mean, again, we're looking at adults who were somehow disadvantaged as adolescents and then we're looking at their employment over time and almost 60 percent of the folks that we're following um, are in real dire economic straits at age 30. Um, like some of them are just in serious poverty and some of them are um, eking out a living uh, like among the working poor and I think what it it shows on in so many dimensions the failure of so much of our social and educational and labor market policy um, that you know like I can see a million different short pieces coming out of this like this is why we need more work-based learning this is why we need more core programs like this is why we need a uh, uh, more programs like ASAP in the why we need more more attention on retention, more attention on retention in post-secondary education. Um, and, you know, I just I really hope that it is. Um, I hope that it's interesting to you. Absolutely. Yeah, we have some folks saying they look forward to that piece as, as am I. And you should feel, Martha, if you ever want to come on again and have a platform to to talk about some of that, please always feel free. Um, but with that, we are at time. I want to keep it want to keep it right on the hour for anyone who has a has a call or an, a, an engagement after this. But Martha, thank you very much for joining us today on this NAF Research and Tech Talk. Um, just a reminder, we will be posting this talk to our Facebook page, to our LinkedIn page. And um, yeah, please uh, feel free to reach out to Martha if you have any other direct questions and be sure to follow her on Twitter. And then also check out the web page I linked there to Brookings Metro for some of her work coming out. You said next month? Yep, hopefully June 14th. We'll see. Okay. Great, great. <laughs> well, thank you very much all. And um, thank you again, Martha, for joining us and just giving us your insights and your your everything, your whole expertise. Your whole oh, thanks, lunch. thanks. All right, take care, everyone. Take care.